Every society has an invisible thread that holds it together. The thread is communication. With communication, we can share our views, our stories, our fears, our joy. We can talk to each other and it makes leaders accountable. And when there is a crisis, communication becomes even more critical. But then, when we need them the most, communication networks can shatter. With broken communication, how do you find families and friends? How do you tell those providing help what is needed or what dangers there are? And for responders who are trying to provide help, without good communication, they can't know what people want and they won't hear people's priorities. Without communication, only those privileged with connections can participate. So are they making informed decisions? Or are they just guessing amongst themselves? Communication is more than just giving people information. Without two-way communication in the right language and shared in the right way, it can lead to confusion and isolation. We may miss those at risk and people particularly vulnerable to exploitation and abuse will not be able to get help. We need to get it right. People should be able to engage and connect when they need to and in their preferred way, so that decisions are shared and processes are accountable. It's about building trust by using the right channels to talk with people, not at them. Good communication lets people retain power and control. It's as important as money, food, shelter, and medicine. It is life-saving. When communication is built on trust, we are better able to prepare for, respond to, and recover from crisis. We build trust by listening to people, providing what they say they need, and sharing control. We become more responsible for our actions and we are held to account for those actions, letting us rebuild together. Good communication enables accountability. Communication is about respect. Communication is aid. Okay, great. Right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to those of you in the room and welcome to those of you that are joining us online. Um, I'm Rosie Jackson. I'm Director of Policy at CDAC Network. Um, and you are welcome to join us in this event, the Inclusion Rebellion, Winning the Communication Battle. So just a little bit of um, uh, some rules. If you could all turn your phone on silence in the room. And because we're spotlighting some of our panelists, if everyone at home or listening online um, could actually mute uh, your microphones and turn off your videos, that would be great. So you're joining us today in a discussion and debate around how, um, what the changes have been and what the landscape around communication, community engagement and accountability, um, how it's faring at the moment. What does, how is the space evolving? We know that um, communications and um, crises are getting even more complex. There's been changes in technology, um, uh, changes in the channels that people use to access um, information and huge changes to the ways that we're working um, together. Um, recent events in Ukraine and the huge prevalence there of mis and disinformation um, begs us to reassess what we know about um, humanitarian action, how we communicate within that space. So most of you will know the CDAC network. We're a network of about 35 members. We're UN, Red Cross, Red Crescent, NGOs, um, media development organizations, and social innovation 
actors. Um, and uh, we've been championing as a network that communication is aid um, for over a decade now and making um, some significant uh, progress. There's lots of expertise on this topic uh, within our network. There's been huge progress made by many of our network members, and that's really worth looking into, but we'll be unpacking some of that um, today. So just, um, I'm going to hand over very soon, um, but soon we will be publishing as CDAC a CCEA landscape study that looks at how at some of these changes over the last two years to um, some of the landscape. Um, we're also uh, publishing a SOGS inclusion study um, that we're going to be linking, we're going to be hearing from the author later on today. And this topic is discussed in many of our evaluations and obviously the evaluations of many of our network members. It's very hot in here. Isn't it? Um, we also discussed this in some of the scoping reports that we've done. So recently we've done one in Papua New Guinea, um, in Sudan, in Colombia, and um, many of these issues are unpacked um, in some of those reports. So they're really worth um, looking into. So it is my great pleasure to hand over to our moderator today, who is uh, Loretta um, Heiber Girabe. I hope that's right. And she's chief of risk. <laughs> It's not. <laughs> uh, I'll let you, yeah, let you do that. Uh, she's Chief of Risk Knowledge, uh, Monitoring and Capacity Development Branch at the UN Office of DRR, of Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, and she has decades of experience um, in this topic in particular, but also across the UN, in UN DRR, OCHA and in WHO, and has been involved throughout that work in most of the major crises over that time period. So brings with her extensive background experience in this topic and within the sector. So I will hand over to you. Thanks very much. Lauren. Thank you so much, Rosie. And um, I'm really excited to be here talking about a subject that I don't get enough time to deal with in my current capacity, but which I think is really current, uh, which is incredibly important, um, not only for humanitarian work, but in also for development work, as well as risk reduction, the communication side. So I, I do have to apologize in advance. I'm afraid I have a bad cold, which I caught on a plane. Now that the masks have come out, the viruses are, you know, roaming freely. So I hope it won't be too disruptive. Um, by way of introduction, I, I'd maybe just start off by saying that um, after I was asked to speak at this event or to moderate it, it occurred to me that it is now over 21 years ago that I wrote a book called Lifeline Media, Reaching Populations in Crisis. And this book, which was funded by the World Bank, really came on the heels of the Yugoslav crisis, where a small NGO that um, I had set up with a few other journalists, I'm a former journalist, uh, looked at how could we use media to reach populations that were really facing the unknown. And in this case, it was uh, the uh, populations of Albania, Macedonia, and Kosovo. Um, so we argued that humanitarian information was necessary um, and uh, that people actually had a right. It was a rights-based approach, that people had the right to information in a crisis setting and that information needed to be accurate and unbiased, but also that their voices should be heard. So now, uh, more than 20 years later, I'm, I'm very gratified to see the work of CDAC and that the humanitarian sector has, in fact, taken on board very much the notions of accountability to affected people, communication with communities. Um, and of course, we see, though, that there are major challenges in how the communication landscape is unfolding. So now, of course, Europe is again at war. Um, and we are still facing the massive pandemic that reverberates across the world. And in both of these major crises, information is just a core critical factor. And maybe I should be more specific. It's the misinformation and disinformation, I think, which is extremely relevant in these contexts and impacting on how we can do humanitarian action. So with the pandemic, we saw the rise of the word infodemic um, and the chaotic scramble for information led to huge volumes of news from every kind of provider, creating conditions ripe for misleading or deceptive information. It became a highly politicized agenda early on, even though it was essentially a public health crisis in the beginning, at least. Um, but there was outright fake news and the spawning of conspiracies. Humanitarians, but also public health workers, including WHO, actually set up sections to help deal with this misinformation. But they also scrambled to adapt their communication and engagement operations in this environment. And particularly, we really saw the rise of social media and the impact that social media has had in how people 
um, establish opinions about a major event happening in the world. So platforms such as Facebook and Twitter and WhatsApp and YouTube became breeding grounds. And, and these are some of the ones that are known in the West. I was living in um, Asia at that time, and there were very specific a Asian platforms that were also spreading information um, about this. So every country had their own different type of social media. Um, but it really reminded us that we had to rely on traditional media sometimes as a source of high quality and trustworthy information. Having said that, many of the traditional media are now also um, called into question when it comes to, you know, are they really unbiased? Is it really accurate? So there is kind of a distrust that has developed around the entire communication and media landscape. Now, with the conflict in Ukraine, we're seeing that communication is challenged in new ways. Um, we have, of course, all uh, we are all very aware that the state run broadcasting in uh, Russia is being used uh, quite heavily to, to fuel uh, support for the Russian engagement in Ukraine. And of course, on the other side, Ukraine is also publicizing very much their stories of heroes and martyrs that, is, that are also fueling support for the Ukrainian position in this conflict. Um, so the, the use of media, the use of information in crisis situations is not new, and it's not new to the humanitarian sector. We saw this even in the Ebola crisis, um, going back decades to the hate speech, which actually fueled the Rwandan genocide. Uh, I actually did some work on this, uh, Radio Milkolin, I don't know if you'll remember that, which actually called people to, to come and to participate in the, in the genocide. Uh, so it's it's a long time that people affected by crises are actually confronted with misinformation, this fog of misinformation. But I guess the question we need to examine is, has the communication battle now outsized and outpaced our ability to monitor, to adapt, and to respond? What do we do in the face of this communication battle, as you are calling it here in CDAC? We are dealing with an unprecedented volume of unchecked online content, digital technologies that put information at our fingertips, and really, we have few options to check that information and to really come back and say, well, that's accurate, that's not accurate. So very hardened positions are developing, and it may be very difficult to actually um, undo some of these positions. But we also have to not forget those who cannot access information and how they are being left behind um, in this information, I would say, overload, but also they have the right to information so that they can make decisions. So today we're going to be tackling some of these issues. We're going to be exploring this new humanitarian communication and information landscape, looking at the context of the pandemic, but also the invasion of Ukraine, and ask ourselves, how does misinformation proliferate? And have our ideas on building trust and engagement changed? And in this jumble now that we have of fact and fantasy and myth, how do humanitarians and affected people navigate this overload and the fog of information? So with me to, to probe these questions um, are Dylan Winder to my left, who's a counselor for humanitarian and migration issues for the UK mission in the UN and WTO in Geneva. He's been with the UK government for over 20 years, uh, first in DFID and now in its successor, which is the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And of course, you have extensive experience in humanitarian policy and emergency response. And we also have colleagues um, online so, Dr. Wunpini Mohammed, Assistant Professor of the University of Georgia's College of Journalism and Mass Communication. So, Wunpini's research focuses on feminism, broadcast media, and development communication. And you've also worked as a radio journalist in Ghana for several years. And most recently, the co-editor of a book, African Women in Digital Spaces, Redefining Social Movements on the Continent and in the Diaspora. And also joining us uh, from abroad is Sud Hanshu Shekhar Singh, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Humanitarian Aid International, a global Indian NGO working to alleviate poverty, hunger, and violence. And Sud Hanshu has three decades of experience in development, humanitarian response, and DRR and advocacy. Um, and you're currently working in the Asia-Pacific region. And finally, Jessica Alexander, who is the policy editor 
uh, at large at the new humanitarian. Jessica has extensive experience in aid operations, evaluation, policy, and has responded to major crises in the last decade. And also the author of a fantastic autobiography called Chasing Chaos, My Decade in and Out of Humanitarian Aid. Uh, also a lecturer at numerous universities. So what a distinguished panel to probe this fascinating issue. But it's not just our panelists, the audience, you yourselves are also heavily involved in this because we'd like you to participate in some polls, just some questions so we can also garner your viewpoints. Um, so please do sign into Slido. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Slido. <laughs> I've been used it several times, but, um, and for those of you who are joining us remotely, you will find the link on the chat, right? So it's right there. And we'll, we want to be able to get your views on this. So with that introduction, let's jump straight in. And the first question goes to you, Dylan. Over the last two years, the UK has been obviously very actively involved in the pandemic response globally. Can you reflect a bit on some of the uh, differences you're seeing in humanitarian communication over the last two years? How has this changed? And do you see any lessons that we might draw from the communication landscape um, in the pandemic to that could now be applied in the Ukraine crisis? So please, the floor is yours. The microphone, gosh, new technology. Um, well, well, first of all, thanks very much for having me on the panel. Uh, it's great to be here with CDAC again. I mean, we, we have, as the UK, are very strong supporters of CDAC since the beginning. Uh, and like you, I've had many years of experience and I think I started my career working in farmer field schools with FAO and <laughs> radio listener groups and, and, and that sort of thing which then evolved to market prices on mobile phones and then we had the internet so so big changes before the last two years but I think your your questions are, are really important ones and I think that fundamentally for us information is now really at the heart of um, the humanitarian response and I and I say that not just in terms of misinformation and disinformation, which of course are risks, but in terms of evidence and how how we set priorities. And so so there's a kind of range of issues linked here. And I think you know there are a number of different questions. So I might I might answer some of the different questions across the panel in in, in mistake. But um, on in terms of the kind of pandemic, I think the key the key lesson for us was actually this wasn't the first time we did it in Ebola as well during the Ebola crisis. Uh, which I was involved in in Sierra Leone, and stratcoms became a really critical issue. So people didn't know, you know, what what. So if you take the Ebola example, people were seeing um, in remote areas people coming in with white suits and Land Cruisers, telling them that they had a problem which they didn't know they had, yeah. and they had lots of other problems. So I think immediately there's a kind of risk there around how does that increase tension? You know, how, how do people react? So there's a kind of important element to any humanitarian response to look at how that story is told you know who are you consulting are you talking to trusted leaders so I th so i think we from the ebola response we drew quite a lot of lessons that then fed into uh the, the covid pandemic um, and i think one of those was around being able to be clear about what the the challenge was but also what other challenges people face so you weren't kind of producing one message in isolation of other other problems um I mean, certainly we worked very closely with the Red Cross uh, societies during the COVID response, and we were a big funder to them, particularly for their Stratcom's work. And again, I think this was a reflection that although you've got a lot of social media uh, and internet and other messaging sort of services, when you've got a lot of disinformation, people trust most the, the trusted people within their communities. So, so you know, r religious groups, elders, you know, Red Cross volunteers. And I think one of the challenges was really how do we how do we use the combination of these materials in a way which does then look at the disinformation. I think I think there are still to be lessons learned from the COVID pandemic. Uh, and I and I think one of them is also you know slightly touches on localization. And and you know we saw. If you look at uh, some of the sort of Rohingya camps, you saw that the work that perhaps international NGOs had been done had done before was now being done by refugees themselves. So, so again, I think it's how do you how do you engage local people in the messaging? And again, it comes back down to that issue of trust. So, so there's kind of for me that's that's a big lesson. Lesson. Um, now, of course, Ukraine is is a is a existential kind of moment for us and of course it's as a result of Russian aggression and, and brutalism and Putin's um, you know war um, but I think you know this as you say there's a kind of there are different elements of this misinformation so there's a kind of misinformation from um, Russia 
on what the state of the situation is, particularly to its own population. So that therefore, does that limit people's objections internally in Russia to the war? So I think there's a kind of challenge there. Um, I think there's also um, then a challenge, obviously, inside Ukraine in terms of how do you how do you provide the right information to something which is changing and evolving incredibly quickly where you don't have the traditional civil society actors on the ground you've got ukrainian civil society groups which which emerge and and, and move around a lot now ukraine of course is an inc incredibly um, well digi digitized mm -hmm. environment so are we making the most of of digital and I, again i don't i mean i'd be interested in more expert views on that so perhaps that's something our pan other panelists can can answer um but i think what we're really concerned about is the implications of misinformation and disinformation. You've seen that a little bit in some of the commentary around ICRC and uh, the UN and how it interacts with their ability to access uh, these settings. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, if you're trying to work in an area where there are non-state armed groups, how do you ensure that the misinformation that they're picking up from wider sources doesn't change their behavior in terms of allowing access to you in, in, in particular settings. So, so I think there is a real sort of, for me, uh, implication of misinformation and disinformation on humanitarian principles, and that could have an impact on access more broadly. Uh, and, and again, it comes back to sort of trust um, as, as well. Um, obviously, you, you know, as part of the response in, in Ukraine, there are a lot of digital platforms. Um, you know, some of which relate to cash programming, some of which relate to this sort of service provision. But again, I would I would be very interested in in um, views from other panelists and maybe yourself having kind of links it links into OCHA about how this this whole piece sits within within the cluster framework. So where is it in the cluster that people are immediately starting to think about these these sorts of issues? And I and I think in my personal opinion. I think we were we were slow footed to understand really the kind of impact of misinformation uh, on on the on the overall response. I think you know the UN and others probably needed a better strategy at the beginning to deal with some of this, particularly because we knew that was what Russia would do. It's done it before. It does it in Syria. So so I think there was something there about lesson learning, and then maybe finally I think um, it's really also about engaging with international media on this and I think there's not enough understanding on inter of it from international media on humanitarian principles how all of these things work and it's quite easy for the international media to skew a story to criticize a humanitarian actor when actually they don't really understand what the issues are and they're, they're, so I think there's a kind of educational issue here for mainstream and tabloid media which come which of course then for us as a government financer of um, aid and with ministers who value public opinion, if we're not getting the right information about what is being delivered, and if the public are getting misinformation, then we've got a job to do in terms of protecting our budgets more, more, more centrally. So those are kind of an, it, some initial thoughts from me, but I, I better leave some time for some of the other panelists. So back to you. Thank you very much for that, Dylan. And I'm wondering if some of our panelists may also want to respond to what you've been saying, because it occurs to me the, the problem with disinformation is not just in the Ukraine war, almost in any crisis setting. Um, but what is the old saying? Information is the first casualty of war. Truth, the truth is the first casualty of war, something of that nature. It has always impacted humanitarian operations. It's actually increased uh, the danger of humanitarian operations, the, the misinformation. And so, you know, has the UN and has the international system really taken that on board and addressed it at the level that we need to? I don't know. I'd love to hear what the audience thinks and also what the other panelists think. But my guess is that we're not quite there yet, although there's been a huge amount of progress that has been made. Um, but let me go now to Jessica. Um, Jessica, the, the question we have for you is, you know, there are many aspects of the Ukraine war that can be compared to the 2015 European refugee crisis, I, I assume, in terms of the outflow of, of populations, the movement of populations from country to country. Um, but are you seeing any parallels and are you, maybe you could also tackle the question of what could we be doing better as an international response system to, to tackle these questions of communication and information in these really volatile contexts. So Jessica, please. Yeah, thanks, yeah, Lori. Thanks, Lori. Can you hear me you hear okay? Me okay? Oh, an echo. Do you all hear it? Yes, we, we're okay, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. so I'll just work through hearing my own voice. Um, 
Yeah, thanks, Lori. Thank you for the question. Thank you to CDAC for inviting me and for having me today. Um, you know, that's that's a, a great question. And, you know, Lori, you started by talking about your experience in um, the CWC space. Um, I also have been working in and following this space for not as long as you, but, um, you know, over over a decade. Um, and, you know, whether it's CWC, whether it's AAP, CEA, you know, Community Engagement and Accountability, choose your acronym. Um, you know, I have seen a real shift over the years. Um, and, you know, this idea of communicating with affected people, um, which was, you know, when I sort of started out or was working on this issue, you know, many years ago, it was it was perceived you know, really as an add-on, something that was the right thing to do. Um, maybe it would increase the effectiveness and the quality of the response, but it definitely wasn't as central or core to the humanitarian response like other interventions, you know, the stuff that we often think of, food, water, shelter, etc. And, you know, I think today, um, since COVID and also what we're hearing with Ukraine, is that, you know, communicating with affected people, I mean, it's no longer a nice to have. It's no longer an add-on. Um, it's a central priority, and it's really core to humanitarian response. It's very much life-saving and life-protecting, and um, especially now it's being prioritized, and people are taking it seriously. I was speaking to a colleague who um, was working on response in Ukraine, and she told me that, you know, for the first time, people are requesting um, a CWC support before they're requesting WASH. Um, people there are seeing people crossing the borders who want information, basic information about what will happen to them, um, their safety, where they can go for services. They're wanting facts about registration processes. Um, they want information about their rights and entitlements. And, you know, this is where we see a lot of similarities to the 2015 European migration response. Um, and, you know, at the time, what the sector found then was that, you know, doing this and doing it well was really hard, um, not only because the population was on the move, but it was a population that was so digitally connected. And, you know, it's not necessarily because humanitarians don't have the digital tools necessary, but you know, people are using channels that they have at their fingertips to communicate and to get their information. And for the large part, you know, humanitarians aren't plugged into those conversations. Um, and one of the main lessons I think that came out of the European migration um, response was to not create new things or new networks or new platforms, but that, that the humanitarian sector needed to plug itself into the conversations that were happening on the ground. And people were already having those um, and finding the places that they're happening. And as Dylan said, you know, who were the trusted sources of information? And I think the other lesson from um, Europe in, in 2015 was that, you know, we were way too slow and we were always sort of playing catch up. Um, People were online, on WhatsApp, communicating about their routes, about border closings, um, where they would go. And aid workers were, you know, trying to get into these WhatsApp groups and those networks so that they could, you know, when thousands of people turned up at a reception center, they were ready and they were there and equipped to provide people with support. But often we were we were too late because we just weren't on top, we being the humanitarian sector, on, on top of, you um, how people were communicating and and just not as actively plugged into those channels and you know today we're seeing all kinds of volunteers putting up sites about you know where refugees can find housing where they can access services um and you know community is still sort of sitting back and discussing, you know, whether we should have a hotline or how we're going to communicate or coordinate our feedback. And, you know, we're the the sector is just too slow um, for the way people are, are communicating today. But I think, you know, it, it takes time to do this well. And um, for many humanitarian organizations, they didn't have a presence in these places before. So by the time the humanitarians are, are setting things up, it, it may be too late for this initial wave of information needs. Um, 
And the other challenge from from Europe, which I just wanted to highlight, which I think is similar to today, is that, you know, this is a very fluid situation. People are moving, their information needs are changing, um, and there are different information needs depending on the kind of of person who who is affected, um, you know, uh, m people who were working um, in Europe in 2015 will recall, you know, speakers on, on the beaches of Greece with recorded messages about where people could go for assistance, what their rights were. Um, but you know, one of the issues was it wasn't in all the necessary languages. Um, that information needs again were different and kept changing, and so make those those sort of static messages became quickly became obsolete. Um, and so you know, the humanitarian set needs to be constantly updating their messaging and and make sure that it's relevant to the information needs of people. Um, but what became really clear then is that communication part of an aid package, just like food, water, or shelter. Um, you know, aid groups then were giving people SIM cards, making sure that there were charging stations at reception centers, ensuring people that had, um, that there were Wi-Fi connections so people could call their loved ones and find out where they were on the route. Um, and, you know, this, this issue of translation was also really critical. I sat in on a session yesterday about misinformation around COVID, and, and that was also something that came out as really critically important too. Um, but it's not just, you know, the languages themselves, but some of these concepts, which, you know, in the case of COVID, it's, you know, complicated health messaging. Um, in this case, you know, asylum and registration procedures, which, you know, aren't necessarily easily translatable. But it's also how the, the information um, is communicated. That's also really critical. So, in, in Europe in 2015, we found that people couldn't absorb all the information that was being thrown at them when they, they arrived at Greece. They were exhausted by their journeys and they needed information in more digestible bits. So making sure that the information was communicated in a way that people could absorb and understand was really important. Um, but, you know, just to get back to, to what Dylan said in your other question, um, you know, we're seeing today this proliferation of rumors um, and that these can have real life consequences consequences, not only for our aid workers, um, but also affected people as aid groups associated with ICRC have, you know, in some places had to pause operations. Um, and rumor management is is really critical. And that requires getting an understanding of or, or understanding where people are getting their information, who are the trusted sources, how to get onto the social media channels that they're using and stopping misinformation before it spreads. And, you know, Dylan, and, and you also spoke about Ebola. We, we also saw this in Ebola, but, you know, I think the difference here um, is that you have such a politically charged and polarized context. Um, and the misinformation campaigns, which stem from these rumors, can easily grow their own legs and snowball and have, you know, as I said, real, real severe and, and um, consequences for humanitarian actors, but also affected people themselves. And, you know, in this case, the misunderstanding is related to neutrality. Um, and, you know, the, the issue of like how um, ICRC was going to to manage those rumors um, that that just spread like wildfire after the the optics of the the visit to Moscow, um, and it gave their this whole controversy legs to to run with. But I think. Most people today who are involved in the response are, are aware of this battle for information. So there's new vigilance, I think, about the optics of messaging um, and a real concern about neutrality and, and what that means in such a hyperpolarized conflict. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it's really about getting ahead of that messaging and understanding how to communicate that with affected people. I don't really have an answer to that because, you know, it was a it's a hard message to kind of relay to to people what neutrality means. And this is why we're meeting you know, with people in Moscow and who, you know, are perceived as the architects of the invasion. It's not really a message that that people are receptive to, but one that, you know, humanitarian organizations need to to be aware of and on top of um, before, you know, the, these rumors proliferate and, and, you know, have these kind of legs to, to run with. So I will pause there and, and let my colleagues have 
take their turn at responding. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jessica. And as you were talking, I was reminded of two things. One of the polio vaccinators who were murdered um, because of the rumors that had been you know, formed around what were what was actually happening with the polio vaccinations um, and the fact that there wasn't a system put in place to counter the rumors. And so therefore, unfortunately, the vaccinators lost their lives. And, and going back a little bit more, uh, question of what do people want themselves? It, it is quite noticeable that the in the case of Ukraine, they're not necessarily waiting for us to put in place communication channels. They are setting this up themselves because there is a need for them to communicate. And you, you rightly pointed out that they have set up, um, they being U Ukrainian refugees, um, have set up networks and online platforms to share information about housing opportunities and where they can get assistance. So it, it does raise the question of to which degree should we be supporting more uh, refugees or people affected by uh, crises to put in place their own communication channels as opposed to us, you know, necessarily doing it. And just, um, I am just also reminded that over 20 years ago in the Yugoslav wars, when there was a needs assessment carried out, um, what do the people who were fleeing the crisis there want? We assumed it was food, water, shelter, but I remember very vividly their number one request was for SIM cards for their telephone. And that had not been at all part of the humanitarian plan. Nobody had even thought about it. Um, so yeah, this has been with us for a while um, and we are learning as we go along, but maybe we need to step up the pace a bit. Um, Wupini, the next question goes to you. With the current communication battle that the humanitarian sector faces, it does seem that some narratives and realities get told while others do not. So obviously kind of inclusion is also an issue here. Why do you think this is, and how does this actually end up impacting humanitarian action? So for the longest time, um, humanitarian work, and even still today, has sort of um, employed a top-down approach, which you just uh, mentioned with the example that you used to um, um, illustrate the point that um, uh, Jessica was making. So um, a lot of humanitarian um, agencies or organizations often take a top-down approach and a paternalistic approach to addressing issues in um, local communities. And that often um, sometimes can bring up um, um, trust issues. And so if the community that you're communicating to does not trust you, um, ultimately they might not want to trust the information that um, you're sharing. And in many um, national contexts, and I'm going to use the U.S. as an example, um, facts and the truth have been so politicized, and we saw it in the dissemination of information around um, COVID, um, and more recently uh, in conversations or narratives around um, the Ukraine issue. So that means that when um, facts or, or the truth gets politicized this way, um, we begin to see um, people using various avenues to disseminate uh, misinformation and disinformation. And I also believe that as we have these conversations, a lot of um, networks through which uh, communication is sort of um, um, disseminated are often left out of the conversation. So for example, in the discussions around the Ukraine crisis, which has tremendously impacted international students, many of whom um, are African, um, Africans have often been sort of presented as mere um, spectators in these sort of global uh, geopolitical discussions. And um, our agency has often been erased, um, even when Africans try to assert their agency so it's important as we have these conversations and um, it's also important for people within the humanitarian sector to think about the ways in which they participate in perpetuation and in perpetuating the um, silencing of certain narratives often from um, marginalized communities within these spaces. So for example, African students were caught in the crossfire of um, the Ukraine-Russia um, crisis and even though a lot of them tried to document their experiences by sharing, you know, videos of the ways in which they were treated at the borders, um, you know, by, for example, Ukrainian um, um, border um, officials. A lot of the information that were being shared um, were presented as fake news, um, not just within you know the Ukrainian space, but also here within the US space. And that was also directly tied to um, the US's interests in, in 
what was going on um, geopolitically within the region. And it's also important to examine the ways in which um, disinformation machinery can be deployed to sort of frame these narratives and um, um, sort of shape these narratives and tell us who's uh, who should be humanized and who should not be humanized. Because a lot of these stories and very sad stories of the experiences of international students, Asian students, Middle Eastern students have gotten lost in, in all of these conversations that are being had. And when there is conversations around aid being sent to Ukraine, very often these people are, um, are not included um, in these narratives. And I'm also interested in thinking about, and I was thinking about the ways in which international media coverage of war um, in Europe is sort of framed versus war in the global South. And I'm thinking about how media can be shaped by colonial legacies. So think about the BBC and, and Reuters and AP and all of those media, CNN and all of those media platforms and the ways in which the way that the, the, they frame the news is definitely shaped by national interests and is also definitely shaped by colonization. Um, and so I'm thinking of um, the extensive coverage that Ukraine got, which is very important and great, because it definitely brought um, attention to the issue and brought aid to the country. But that also means that we have to think about the empathy fatigue that we often sort of espouse when we think about other countries like Palestine um, and Somalia and Afghanistan and Kashmir. Right, all of these other communities are often not um, accorded um, the humanization that we saw in the narratives that were presented um, within this particular conversation. And so um, let's think about marginalization and the impact of marginalization in the way that narratives are framed and how um, the organizations within which we work can be complicit um, in sort of reproducing um, oppression. So it's not just even in media narratives, but it's also in how we frame um, stories around marginalized people in the way that in the ways that we teach, and this is something that I reflect on as a teacher in my classroom, in the ways that we do work um, in, in within the humanitarian sector, and in the ways that we generally think about the world. So I think that we we have to continue to um, examine power politics and how that has shaped um, conversations around the Ukraine crisis. And we also need to think about the stories that have gotten lost um, within the cracks. Not, not they haven't been lost because you know they are not being told. It's just that the agency of these groups uh, who are telling their own stories are often um, sort of erased um, by. And, and this has been done through the presentation of these narratives as you know um, people basically. Um, not not knowing that that is the truth and not presenting what they believe to be the truth. So another example is when when for example I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the African students and um, their presentation and how that looked like within the U.S. context. So uh, there were discussions on Twitter where people were like, oh you know, we don't think that these international students are being marginalized. We don't think that they're being mistreated at the border. It is definitely Russian disinformation that is being, that is being used to manipulate um, African American, um, African Americans within the US to be uh, sympathetic to the Russian cause when that really was not actually the case. These were just uh, students who were trying to get out safely. Thank you so much. I mean, you really uh, share a, a wealth of um, of thinking about these complex issues, and I, I really think that um, your reflections on the African students who were living through something that was obviously quite traumatic deserved attention and des deserved to be understood as um, uh, a crisis in its own rights. Just wasn't wasn't picked up by the media, and instead a narrative that was created, which actually did damage. I, I think that really gives us a lot of um, things to think about. But l let me now go, and thank you for that, uh, but let me now go to Sudhansha, because I think it would be interesting to hear your perspectives on what are those factors that are contributing to certain voices really getting this dominance, gaining the dominance in the current communication climate, while we see other voices are very much being left behind. And, and not able to have that same, um, I would say, uh, focus. Could you share your thoughts on that, please? Uh, <clears throat> uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, to this uh, <clears throat> panel discussion. See, in my opinion, uh, the crisis has huge uh, uh, 
commercial possibilities. You know. It has huge commercial possibilities for NGO sector, for media, and for market. And when you commercialize any opportunity, you cannot just be based on facts. You have to exaggerate in uh, in order to get maximum benefit out of it. And this is what we are seeing in almost all conflicts. And they see that's why even today, if you see the discussion so far, has primarily been around conflicts because conflicts have more commercial value than other kind of disasters, say natural disasters. And that's the unfortunate part of it. So if uh, uh, we see, uh, uh, take example of Ukraine or uh, NGOs or uh, market, everyone has been exaggerating. Uh, if we see the, the, the uh, social media handles of uh, different humanitarian agencies, their focus is on their outreach and the, ex the, the massive problem, the massive plight of the people and the number of displaced people, and then they're showing we are there. So give us funds. Every single, uh, since today morning, I was checking so many Twitter handles on Ukraine, and I didn't find any talking about solutions. Everyone is talking about, yes, we can provide food, this and that. We tend to forget that while millions of people are affected all around the world, uh, they don't require aid forever. They need uh, sustainable solutions, durable solutions, and early solutions. And in this profitability commercialization, we tend to over, uh, overlook that, and we just exaggerate and we provide uh, uh, misinformation. And what makes some uh, voices more powerful than that? I think uh, earlier uh, uh, it was mainstream media, and we considered a few decades ago, whatever came in the mainstream media, we considered that authentic whether it was TV or newspaper, but with the advent of social media, we started tri triangulating. And then we realized that there was, there was, there was so much of propaganda. These new, new, uh, 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 media houses also have certain vested interests. They're also run by certain agencies which have agenda and news is peddled accordingly. Now, with the advent of uh, uh, social media, of course, we have the distrust has gone up, but that doesn't mean we have started getting authentic information. Rather, it has added to that. Now, if you see, there are verified handles on different social media. Blue tick. And blue tick makes you more powerful. Millions of followers. And if you have millions of followers, then that brings more weight to you. And that's really bad because their uh, market approaches these people who have huge social media following and they get paid to make certain kind of post and that adds to misinformation and disinformation. Uh, see, Ukraine is started almost 80 uh, days ago, this war bro broke out. It has not affected only people living in Ukraine or Russia. It has impacted uh, people world over. The inflation in India is unimaginable. Sri Lanka, we are seeing what is happening. It is on the verge of collapse and people are dying there in, in the protest. And why? Because of misinformation where the focus is news agencies are after uh, how many viewers are there for them and NGOs, how many millions they can mobilize. UN agencies, same. I would blame UN agencies also. No one is just giving us objective analysis of the situation so that people can, can demand for an early solution. And let me very quickly go to the uh, uh, other uh, problem which we talked about, which is COVID. You see the market. See, COVID was unprecedented because usually natural disasters impact people who are vulnerable, who know that they are vulnerable. But this uh, uh, pandemic impacted everyone. So there was the kind of panic which was unimaginable. Market encashed that. Uh, some multilateral agencies and INGOs encashed that. And they peddled, they commercialized a certain product and made millions and billions. And what happened, even middle class people, they fell in the trap of poverty. And most of these medicines and vaccines were not required that point. But since people were panicked, they just believed and got uh, uh, trapped into that. A couple of points and then I'll stop. Uh, uh, see, Darren, you also talked about uh, uh, Rohingya response and how the community started managing uh, the program. I would disagree with that. You know? uh, many organizations try to project COVID-19 as a very good example example of localization. I disagree. It was the ugliest phase of localization where international actors who otherwise love to see, uh, to be on ground, to show that they are there, uh, again for 
uh, with some commercial element they were not there because the covid was a risk so let local actors and local people take lead so what if some of them die and they died so we cannot certainly present that as a, a very good example and uh, kashmir was also referred and let me tell you world over i follow almost all media world over there is so much misinformation about, about kashmir there is no truth uh, there is wasted energy no one knows the reality of kashmir and if you knew you will talk differently and if you don't know you see most of the thing most of the times information is uh, either based on half truth and if it is based on half truth it's very difficult to challenge it because there is some element of truth it's not complete truth some element of truth so very difficult to uh, uh, challenge that uh, and kashmir is half truth and then information it's again colonial angle when most of the information is in english and then it's a problem of comprehension you have the information but does it reach to me and if it has reached to me whether i am in a uh, uh, in a position to uh, uh, understand and for that this reason sometimes there is very deliberate poor dissemination so that there is information but shouldn't reach the people because if they know the senior will be different i stop here Thank you. thank you very much for those thoughts and I hope everyone could hear the line was a little bit uh, challenging but you you really covered a, a wealth of uh, topics there and you know you certainly pointed out the the self interest that we all have in using media to generate resources uh, to to propagate ideas um and then the the question of localization you mentioned as well as well as the type of misinformation that exists for other types of crises not only ukraine so it is it is definitely a problem that exists now we are running a bit short on time and the idea was that we would go to a question of the audience now um which is you know this is such a vast topic i mean we're talking about everything from the political disinformation to the challenges humanitarians have to provide information to populations fleeing crises um but i guess what it would be good to know is really how do you see those very key challenges that humanitarians face with this new communication and information landscape and and i do think that even though it is a vast issue if we can identify what those key challenges are we may start to find very practical solutions moving forward so please go ahead and um come up with some answers so i see funding uh, uh, arrogance that's an interesting one we think we know better and we have to tell people and use media to do so i guess that's what you mean but i'm not sure but um uh clarity of mission being clear anglocentrism i mean that's an interesting one because um and i and i think that our you know some of our speakers were alluding to this before the big media outlets the bbc cnn and others that have an international dominance tend to actually have a certain western point of view that they proliferate um who defines truth that's a great one uh whose truth is it i guess the fear of sharing um some other ones lack of understanding lack of trust flexibility and agility clarity of mission great um wonderful if we could think about what are some ways that we can tackle these challenges um how can we do a better job okay but why don't we move ahead now because uh we do have to move on to the the question of um inclusion which was another issue that we really wanted to discuss today and in our conversation around the current humanitarian communication landscape we have talked already we've heard a lot today about the issues of power dynamics anglocentrism for example trust localization um and there are other issues also that emerged uh but we what we would like to really think about is who is most impacted by this communication challenges that we're facing today and the pandemic but i think other crises as well have demonstrated that marginalized groups are most impacted by disasters and crises and in fact i come from the disaster risk reduction um world right now and whether it's the pandemic whether it's a flood whether it is an earthquake or a cyclone it is those that are um the most excluded from societies that are most impacted the ones that are least able 
to benefit from the resources that are made available. And so it does stand to reason that they will also be on the front line of impacts from this communication uh, battle. So inequalities in terms of access and to quality and accurate information, but also being targeted. We certainly remember in the COVID crisis when I was in Asia, the migrant population being very heavily targeted, being accused of um, bringing COVID to to communities when in fact they were being forced to, to leave their livelihoods with very short notice. The mistrust in institutions, the digital divide, all of these are really contributing to differential exposure and vulnerability to mis and disinformation. So the notion of leaving no one behind, what does that actually mean in this communication battle? And can we, can we ensure that leaving no one behind becomes the antidote to misinformation? So this is what CDEC and friends are calling the inclusion rebellion. And I really like that terminology. Um, it really does hinge though on considering the power dynamics, the trust, the structural issues that foster misinformation and looking at what are the kinds of tailored communication approaches that can be inclusive to the different needs of uh, to counter misinformation. So we're now going to have a short video to introduce the topic of inclusion by Emily Dwyer, who's the founder and co-director of Edge Effect. Emily is a trans woman, a humanitarian development professional working on the inclusion of different sexual orientation, gender identity and expression and sex characteristics. A former journalist, uh, Emily has worked for several major broadcasters and led media development programs across the world. And she also has a humanitarian background, including roles at OCHA, Internews, and Oxfam. And she founded Edge Effect in 2017. So let's hear what Emily has to say on this issue. Thanks for this chance to ask a question. In many countries around the world, LGBTIQ people face discrimination, violence and exclusion enacted by families, communities or in so many other aspects of their lives. And this doesn't stop just because there's been a humanitarian crisis. In fact, in disasters, people are often looking for reasons why crises have happened and so they blame people, including LGBTIQ people. The first image that you're looking at was circulated on social media in Indonesia shortly after the 2018 earthquake and tsunami that impacted on South Sulawesi. It equates the letters LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, with four Indonesia language terms for different kinds of disasters, implying that LGBTIQ people cause those disasters, implying that disasters occur as a kind of divine punishment for the supposed sins of LGBTIQ people and the societies that tolerate them. The second image is from Indonesia, and is one of many examples from the COVID-19 pandemic in which LGBTIQ people were blamed for spreading the virus. In this case, the target are hijras, a cultural gender group, neither men nor women who live in South Asia. Hijras often face discrimination and are treated badly, considered dirty, and these posters draw upon and amplify that kind of stigma. Now, often when we raise issues of LGBTIQ inclusion in crises, we're told by humanitarian organisations that there isn't much that they can do, that there are problems of context, problems of the potential to do harm. Now, sometimes that's true, but we also know that many humanitarian organisations don't train their staff to work on LGBTIQ issues. They haven't adapted their tools to be inclusive of LGBTIQ issues. They haven't built partnerships with LGBTIQ organisations and they don't put LGBTIQ into funding proposals for, for donors. So, there's also lots of times where context and the potential to do harm also seems a bit like a convenient excuse. A convenient ex excuse for not having developed the capabilities, a convenient excuse for not prioritising LGBTIQ people. So my question to the panel is, when are we going to see humanitarian organisations actually genuinely including LGBTIQ people in work to counter rumours and in other communications and community engagement programs? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emily. And okay, this is a question that's being asked to us in the humanitarian community. When are we going to start um, really genuinely including LGBTIQ people um, and work to counter rumors? And, and let me tell you from my own experience, this is a real issue. I know that in one of the countries I was working in, um, in my previous position, uh, 
LGBTIQ people were not allowed into evacuation centers um, for tsunamis. So it is definitely something that we need to tackle. But I'm going to go first to Wunpini. You've done a lot of work around how mis and disinformation can be shaped by inequalities in media access. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more? What do you see are these intersections between marginalized groups, the, div the digital divide, but also the spreading of false narratives? Please. Yeah, so a lot of work uh, needs to be done when we talk about marginalization and accessibility, um, or access to um, digital, digital platforms, we are thinking about multiple intersections of the digital divide. Um, so it's not just a lack of access to technologies like laptops and, and mobile phones, it's also a lack of um, access to internet data if you do have um, um, those um, technologies it's also um, limited sort of um, digital literacy a lack of li uh, digital literacy a lack of technological literacy so these are some of the intersections that we see in in these levels of access when we talk about um, the digital divide and so as we try to address this divide we have to think extensively about um, the multiplicities of these sorts of intersections and how how to address them. So for example, if you're trying to help women in the rural community have access to, let's say, Facebook to um, be part of the digital public sphere or participate in civic engagement, um, just giving them um, smartphones is not going to fix the issue. You have to um, understand what the implications of giving them smartphones are and how they are socially and culturally situated within their community. And you also have to make sure that they are um, you know, they undergo some sort of training to become digitally literate to be able to use these sorts of platforms. So we have to think about them in these ways. Um, and I also believe that in order to address these um, uh, issues of accessibility, we need to take a culture-centered approach to sort of addressing um, um, these inequalities. And so when I say a, a culture-centered approach, we have to think about the way that culture, structure, and agency sort of shape access and how um, this information, for example, can sort of restrict um, people's, uh, marginalized people's enactment of their agency um, as far as participating in, in these digital public spheres are concerned. Um, and a very good example is, and I want to go back to use um, health um, communications and what that has um, um, looked like in the past and what we can learn um, um, from that. So for example, um, when COVID hit a few years ago, you know, a lot of countries were scrambling to figure out how to sort of address that and how to make sure that people were getting access to the right information. So in countries or in communities where there were already infrastructure in place, um, for example, in Ghana, where we already had like health campaign infrastructure in place to address issues like malaria and, uh, you know, HIV and all of that, it was easy to sort of tap into these already existing structures to sort of um, disseminate information about, about COVID. But in places where those structures were not necessarily in place, interestingly, like within the US, it was difficult and this it was difficult to sort of disseminate um, accurate information. And in turn, because those structures were not in place, health became a politicized issue where it was like, uh, if you do believe that COVID exists, you're probably all the way to the left, right? And it had this, the same issue was something that uh, we dealt with here in the US with regards to vaccine accessibility. So in countries, a lot of the times in countries that have a strong developmental uh, development communication um, framework or communication for social change framework, um, these particular issues that are often factual do not become contentious issues or issues that are used for or that are politicized by um, various political act actors. So for example, even beyond um, public health campaigns that are instituted by the government or the state in, in these countries, countries like Ghana, other non-state actors participated because of the structures that were already in place. They use their platforms to participate in sort of spreading information. They use the ethos that they had to participate in spreading um, accurate information about the, the pandemic. So for example, in Ghana, musicians like Fancy Gadam would um, made a song about COVID and teaching people how to protect themselves from getting COVID. Um, in Cuba, Buena Fe, uh, which is a, a Cuban band, um, 
created a song or, or they made a song about um, the, the vaccine and why it was important for people to get vaccinated and, and all of that. So um, it wasn't just um, one particular actor within that national context that was doing the work. It was like a community-based approach where everyone who could um, chip in would chip in and use their huge platforms to make sure that um, accurate information was sort of disseminated. And I think that right now, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to connect to trying to answer one of the questions that was put there about how how can how humanitarian actors can sort of um, counter or, or address the issue of disinformation that you're dealing with. I be, I believe that right now there's not we are not changing quickly to sort of suit the changes that are happening within the digital platform that produce um, disinformation and misinformation. So a lot of um, organizations are still using traditional modes of communications like newsletters and maybe TV and radio and all of that. And so there is a huge gap within the digital um, platforms with regards to um, the messaging apps like WhatsApp and Telegram I mean, all of those platforms as far as information dissemination is concerned. And those are where um, fake news really thrive, right? And there are a lot of people on those platforms who don't have Facebook accounts or Twitter accounts or who cannot navigate um, these digital platforms to get access to um, the right information that they need. So a good example of a media organization that is doing good work to sort of address this particular space is The Continent. So it's called The Continent. It's a news platform, um, an African um, news platform that specifically tailors its new news content to WhatsApp platforms, right? So when they create a new story, they share it on WhatsApp platforms as an image with like maybe 500 words or 300 word um, 300 word story where they share important information, they share accurate information to the populace. So there is a huge gap on gap on these platforms where people who are mostly a lot of Africans, a lot of people in the global south who get most of their information on these platforms via voice notes and videos and, and texts and images are not um, getting access to correct information. So I think that is one of the ways in which humanitarian actors can sort of address the gaps in communications because, you know, still communicate using your newsletters and TV and radio interviews and all of that, but you need to do work to fill the gap within the digital sphere that um, where a lot of disinformation um, sort of happens. And there's also other ways that we can do that. It, historically, um, in many Global South countries, they have used edutainment, education and entertainment together to share accurate information. A good example is a malaria program called Hihaho. When I was growing up in Ghana, there was a radio drama every Sunday, which would talk about how to prevent malaria and all of that, right? And it was, um, you know, a project that was done in collaboration with the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation and the Ghana Health Service and all of these organizations and so just getting access to um, accurate information through entertainment is fun right so all of these are ways in which we can think about um, sort of addressing um, the issues that we need to think about especially as far as um, gaps within the digital spaces are concerned right thank right. thanks for that and indeed uh, behavior change communication has often relied on uh, education um, uh, entertainment actually to, to, and also to tackle issues that can be culturally sensitive, but let's, I, I do recognize that we are running really short on time. So I'm just wondering if I could, um, ask, uh, Sudhansha and Jessica and Dylan to keep your, keep your reflections on this particular part a bit short. Um, but so we can really kind of wrap up towards the end, but, um, I would be interested, Sudhanshu, in your experience, when people are excluded, from um, the communication channels and, and they can only rely, for example, on other people. Are they actually inadvertently contributing to misinformation and what, what can be done about that? Maybe you could just share a few thoughts on that issue. Uh, see, <clears throat> very, very complex question. And uh, let me be very honest that this <clears throat> app uh, interests me the least. I'm quite disillusioned with the discussion around app. The problem with uh, this the, the, the jargon is, or the abbreviation is, the the new colonial uh, coloniality. You know, all the discourse is still dominated by the North and very ISC and UN centric. You know, World Humanity Summit happened in 2016, Grand Bargain and uh, Charter for Change, etc. emerged in 2016, and six seven down six seven years uh, down the line. The international actors haven't yet reached out to local actors. There is not good 
uh, equal partnership with local actors. There is not uh, proper communication in with, with local actors. Forget about affected population. How would you reach to affected population if you are not well connected, if you don't have good partnership with local organizations? And that hasn't happened. So that's why this discussion doesn't interest me or I'm, uh, I, 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 I quite frustrates me now. <clears throat> so second thing is that whenever you talk about up, again you go uh, perhaps on the back of your mind, again uh, uh, areas facing protective crises are on your mind because there you have plenty of time to consult with the people. What about an area where uh, a sudden disaster has occurred? How will you go for up? if you uh, uh, didn't have any presence and these are unanswered questions so for me if international organizations are really interested about uh, affected population uh, lgbt community etc then the first thing they should realize what is within their capacity and within their capacity is to go to the next level of partners and establish very good partnership equal partnership with them and facilitate them to go to the next level and have the similar kind of partnerships. If international actors directly talk about app, we'll keep talking forever on that. We will never reach there, like so many other things in international discourse. OK, that, that's well understood. I'm wondering, Jessa, can I ask you to, to really respond to what uh, Sujansa is raising here? And I mean, essentially, there is perhaps a bigger issue around communities trust of the humanitarian sector. It is dominated, I think, as we've heard from the north and um, the localization agenda that we had aimed to put in place years ago is still not really there uh, yet. So what is it that we're still not getting right? We're not building the trust. We're not really addressing the, the needs of the most marginalized groups and their entire parts of society, such as the LGBTIQ, who are being left behind. So what is it we're not getting right? Yeah, thanks, Lori. Um, <clears throat> and Sudanshi, thank you for your comments. This is something that you and I have spoken about before, too, for some of um, the reporting for the new humanitarian. Um, you know, one one thing that I was surprised didn't come up in this word cloud that was just created was, you know, this this the word of power. And I think, you know, that's still where the aid system is stuck that, you know, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, you know, we've seen this proliferation of tools and guidance and frameworks on how to consult and engage affected people. But, you know, the, the fundamental power imbalance still stands. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about inclusion and, and empowering in these kinds of meetings and these conferences. Um, but, you know, what we do know is that localization, the particip the so-called participation revolution, I mean, those are the areas that, you know, really did quite poorly um, over the years. Um, and, it, and it comes down to this imbalance of power. Um, people on the, the receiving end of aid have, have such a little say in what's provided, how it's provided, and they don't have control over the decisions about aid and that, that impact their lives. Um, but I just want to talk briefly about research that um, the New Humanitarian um, did w in partnership with Brown Truth Solutions. And this was in, in Haiti because it really we, we attempted to unpack these issues of power and see how these efforts to put people at the center were actually going from the perspective of affected people. And as won't be surprising to those of us in the room, I mean, there was a, a very wide gap between um, AIDS promises and the reality that people experienced. But what was interesting to me is that the, this gap um, was highest when it came to issues of transparency. 98% um, of people wanted to know about how money was spent in their communities, but only 2% said that they had any idea. Um, people want much more than what you know our our traditional sort of accountability to affected people approaches offer. Um, they're they're not necessarily looking for information about how to access aid, um, but they want and and really expect information about the aid process. They want to know where aid comes from. 
who makes decisions, how money is being spent, um, and they want to be more represented um, in by by members of their community and for where these decisions are being made, um, and they want to have ownership over the processes that are impacting their lives. And so, you know, these basic feedback mechanisms or information sharing, you know, those don't really change the this status quo of giver receiver relationship. Um, you know, it's a much more um, holistic effort that aid groups need to be be doing. Um, but, you know, related back to this sense of mistrust, you know, it, it's not surprising that that, you know, this sense of exclusion and this power imbalance will breed mistrust. And if aid organizations don't share information and if their transparency is one of the biggest things that that is lacking. Um, and if people aren't engaged, then how do we expect them to really trust the humanitarian sector? And that opens the window for misinformation. They'll go elsewhere to find other forms of, of information. And um, I know we're, we're short on time, so I'll stop there because I do want to talk about um, at you know, hopefully we'll have time about, you know, the ways that that the new humanitarian itself is also working to, you know, counter some of this misinformation and as, you know, a, a, a trusted news source um, in this regard as well. Thanks, Jessica. And, and now I'll go to you, Dylan. Now, Emily in her video asked us a very specific question. What is it that the humanitarian community should be doing? Or even she put it like this, when are we actually going to see humanitarian organizations genuinely, including LGBTIQ people, and actively work to counter the rumors and to ensure that the communication and community engagement programs are really part of the humanitarian response? How do you think our panelists have done in trying to answer that? Where are the gaps still that we're not quite getting it? Any thoughts from you? Thanks, um, Laura. Difficult question, but I wanted to just kind of come back on, a, on an interesting point. So, in the in the kind of uh, poll, who do we trust? Uh, Sitanthu disagreed with me on the Rohingya crisis. I got my information from UN, NG, UNHCR and international NGOs. Where did your information come from? And I think that the question really goes back to this issue about localization being not just a check; it's about empowerment. And, and how do we, you know, we as the UK government are not able to work with thousands of small local actors. So how does that information get filtered up to really then shift away from just community engagement, but to look at where where is where is the impact of this? What what what? How does that then feed into decision making? And for me, that's how the the system really needs to change. I think AAP has become a bit of a tick tick box exercise. Yeah. You know, and it's not really then linking up um, enough into this whole piece around empowerment and, and decision making. I also wanted to really agree with uh, Wimupin that um, digital and tech is really, really critical and we need to be much better, much more savvy. I mean, the UK in our humanitarian work is really going to focus on that element of things. But I do think we shouldn't forget radio and, and, and some of the other media because clearly it's it's still important in, in other places. Um, and then on your, your question, <laughs> I think I'd probably ask Martin Griffiths what he's planning to do on this. But I do think that Emily makes a really important point around, you know, a particular vulnerable group. She talked LGBTI, could be religious minorities, could be people with disability. You know, how do we make sure these needs are included? But also, how do we make sure people are able to access information that is relevant to them? And I th so I think I think there's a kind of two way flow here. I don't have a solution, um, but I certainly think there are some of the new tech out there is, is really interesting. Is that accessible? Will that will that actually resolve some of these power differentials? Is it about how we actually engage with 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 people and those groups themselves? But how do we do that when we have a kind of multiplicity of small groups? I mean, I think we're seeing that a little bit in in Ukraine as well. You know, there's so many different small civil society organisations operating. How, how are we as the international community, particularly if we are to fund these things? I mean, that's the other thing. You know, I think someone talked about funding it's important that we are able to understand that complexity. Um, so I don't think I've really answered your question, <laughs> but but I think I think you know this is probably your question. Ocha's, Ocha's producing a new um, strategy. I, I understand that the kind of IASC system is kind of refreshing itself. There's, you know, been discussion, discussion about where next for the humanitarian system. I think the, the discussions today have, have really shown some great 
innovative thinking, but how do we make sure that new thinking feeds into these discussions and how do we make sure it's not just the same old um, INGOs, donors and, and UN agencies that are driving this kind of ref the sort of reform processes. So I, I kind of I, I think it, we should continue the conversation, I guess. OK, we we are. Thank you very much for that, Dylan. We have just uh, about nine minutes left. So what I would like to do is to ask our panelists to answer the question we're going to ask you, but also kind of share your final thoughts on the issue as well. It's clearly not something we're going to resolve today. It's a very vast subject. Um, but I do think we need to start thinking about solutions. So I would like to ask everybody just two minutes. Sorry to be um, to ask you to be so short on this, but uh, I, I do want all the panelists to speak. So Sudansh, let's go back to you. And, and um, what do you think minority or local actors or excluded groups, as we heard from Emily, what can they do to ensure their voices are heard? Um, within humanitarian responses. And then, you know, conversely, what is it that humanitarian actors can do to address these power balances that we've spoken about today that actually lead to local voices being silenced? So two, uh, two minutes reflections on that and any final points you'd like to make as yeah, well. Very quickly. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And let me very quickly go to this Bangladesh Rohingya. When this Rohingya crisis was unfolding, the Rohingya crisis was unfolding. I was there in Bangladesh and one senior person from one of the UN agencies was very sarcastically uh, told me, Sudhanshu, uh, this crisis has come as blessing in disguise to us. I said, what do you mean? That, see, from funding wise, we are going down. And now uh, this because of this crisis, we are coming going to come up with a huge appeal and then we need not worry for next five years. That's the unfortunate reality of our sector obsession with funding and obsession with control, uh, uh, retaining uh, uh, and feeling powerful. And because of all these uh, the, the, the mentality, we are not able to deliver. International actors are particularly not able to deliver. International actors haven't shared their commitments with their country offices. And that's the problem. You must have come across the report when the rubber hits the road. That's a Rohingya, uh, 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 that exposes the localization in uh, Cox's Bazaar, Rohingya response. Not much has done. So when country offices, intermediaries are obsessed with funding, they are expanding in our countries through their country offices to capture resources wherever they are, to capture decision-making platforms wherever they exist. We are not going to see any changes. We local actors also need to come out of this colonial hangover and stop trying to uh, trying to get included in every process which emerges in the north now there is a lot happening in south there is enough there are enough resources in south and i think if local actors are really willing uh, to get included they should start focusing more on south south cooperation i have spent my life 34 years in the sector i have been part of many many humanitarian reform processes and eventually i have seen i have seen little results, whether it is transformative agenda or grand bargain, which is ending next year, highly unlikely it will be re, uh, renewed without much result. So local actors will have to realize their power and ask international actors one thing, please vacate space. Don't fundraise in our countries. Our resources belong to us. That's it. OK, so I mean, what we're basically saying is that the communication uh, issue is just one part of a larger problem around the entire humanitarian architecture, um, which we probably will not be able to resolve in the next five minutes. But I think it's important that we recognize that it is a larger question of power dynamics between recipient countries and um, the, the, the the donor, you know, relationships. But um, let me go to you, Wupini, and ask you, you've spoken already about some of the cultural structures of the marginalized groups, but coming from the an academic perspective, could you just in, in about one or two minutes, <laughs> it's getting shorter and shorter, but could you, what do you see the humanitarian sector doing to really better handle and better tackle this issue of communication, communication gap, but also the exclusion that we see of um, different groups? Right. Um, so what the sector can do, uh, one of the things that the sector can do uh, can be to create the conditions for local actors to assert their own agency. Um, to tell their own stories. Um, and I think that's uh, one of the very important things to do. And I think that one of the ways that the humanitarian sector can do, which is often 
um, driven by um, um, Global North interests is to even reflect on um, ethics and the implications of ethics within the communities that they are operating. So are you ethically engaging these communities? And would you do what you're doing in those communities in the UK? Would you do that in the US, right? And, and um, I think that that would definitely help um, them think about the way that they are ethically engaging these communities um, within the context of communicating. Um, and there are also other things that can be done, especially with, the, uh, with regards to the agency. So draw on indigenous and local modes of communication. So an example is, is like, for example, in Ghana, um, during COVID, in some communities, they use they would use the mosque PA system to sort of communicate um, COVID um, information, or they would use a traditional town crier to communicate um, that information. And because these um, modes of communications have historically been established and have been in existence for a long time, they are often um, trusted by these communities. So if you're working with the chief in the local community or the um, religious leaders in the local communities, you're doing a great job. It's also important for uh, humanitarian actors to um, re-examine the colonial legacies embedded in um, their practice Praxis, and some of them include paternalism, um, saviorism, and white supremacy. And there are also other resources to think about um, framing narratives about marginalized communities. And recently, I was part of a program um, by Dubai Cares and Dubai Expo on dignified storytelling, which brought together a lot of um, actors from all of uh, this, you know, all sectors, including academia, to create resources on how to um, do, um, to, you know, tell stories in a human. Pini, I think you're you're we've lost you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? No, you got frozen for a moment. Um, I, we maybe just if you could just wrap up your last uh, your last sentences there again because we lost you for a second. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat that. I believe that uh, humanitarian actors um, need to re-examine the colonial legacies embedded in their praxis, which uh, include paternalism, saviorism, and white supremacy. And there are also other resources, for example, um, by Dubai Cares and Dubai Expo called Dignified Storytelling, which basically brought together academics and humanitarian actors and NGOs to come together to develop um, resources or um, a guide on how to tell stories about marginalized people in a dignified way. Those are really very concrete and practical solutions. So I thank you very much for that. Jessica, um, we just have a minute or two left, but um, you are working for the new humanitarian and we've, we've heard about mainstream media, but also, you know, journalism more generally. What is it that you think that the journalists can do to foster more trust and inclusion? Maybe, maybe in just a minute. Yeah, I'll um, I'll try to keep the, this brief. Um, you know, when Pini, you, you said that, you know, we, for aid workers to create conditions for local actors to tell their own stories, and that's something that uh, we at the New Humanitarian are, are really doing. But before I get into that, um, you know, from the, the going back to the 2015 migration movement, you know, what, the messaging around that was really important. So calling it the European migration crisis, you know, triggered fear of refugees. And it wasn't a crisis for Europe at all. It was a crisis in the places that people were fleeing from. But it was a deliberate attempt to you know, stoke fear among Europeans and paint this picture that this was an unmanageable crisis for Europe. Um, I wanted to get into some points that were made by an op-ed contributor in the New Humanitarian um, by Thomas Coombs from Hope Based Communications, but I won't, but I encourage you readers to, to or uh, participants to read it. It's called um, How Talking About Humanity and Not Crisis Can Aid All Refugees Right Now. But, you know, he really talked about the importance of, of referring to humans and people um, and not refugees and asylum seekers and show their individual stories and not this wave of humanity flooding borders. Um, and there are other some some other really, you know, interesting points that he has there, not only for journalists, but also for for aid workers and in their messaging and their communications, their press releases. Um, at the New Humanitarian, we're, we're doing a few things related to this. And, and, you know, first, you know, 
just to say that that we've been covering Ukraine since 2014 and even before. So we have this long term perspectives. We have stringers in the country who have knowledge of the conflict and, and how it's evolved over the time over time. And so they know the context and the complexities really well. And importantly, and going back again to Mumpina's, Mumpina's point, you know, we've commissioned a bunch of first person pieces in this context. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, there's so much being published about Ukraine now. And we're trying to, to break through the noise, you know, these these huge geopolitical questions, a potential nuclear war, you know, what's the future of Europe? What, you know, is there going to be a confrontation between Russia and the US? Um, you know, we've tried to keep the, the focus on people who are affected and telling stories in their voices. Um, these first persons, you know, we, we published a war diary at the two month mark, and that was a big part of, of that attempt. You know, we, we published a first person narrative from a blind woman in Ukraine to tell her experience of war as a blind person um, and a first person Syrian um, talking about the difference in treatment that they experienced crossing the Belarus border. Um, and we're also ensuring that, you know, these local voices are presented in an authoritative way and not just, you know, taking a, a voice box, but they're experts who, who have solutions. And we want to make sure that we, you know, have a platform for, for that. And we recently did a, a op-ed, for example, with a Palestinian woman who gave, you know, a really authoritative take on how aid can be fixed in Palestine. But I just want to say, too, that, you know, because there's so much attention on Ukraine right now, we're also trying to find ways to expand the attention to other contexts. And while it's important, we're also really aware that other places need attention too, and they may be further down the agenda and out of visibility because Ukraine is just sort of sucking all the oxygen out of, of you know, the mainstream media and getting so much attention. So we've also used our platform to expand the conversation beyond Ukraine. And just one final point, going back to the Haiti research, I just want to, you know, not to end on a down note, but you know, we did a webinar um, in Haiti with government leaders, also the UN and local civil society, and they really, you know, are taking the information that what came from affected people and using it to to um, you know uh, make their their response decisions. Um, and they're looking to, you know, include more and more community leaders. And, you know, there, there's still a lot to be done, but this was really encouraging. And this is the kind of leadership, I think, that, you know, will really push the, the participation revolution to the to the next level. So thank you. I know I went over. Sorry. That's OK. We, we, we're just a little bit over, but we probably do need to wrap it up. And the last word is yours, uh, Dylan. So the question is, of course, the donor community is incredibly important. And I think the very first word that came up in the word bubble was funding. <laughs> but you have an incredibly important role to play in adapting, in helping the humanitarian system adapt to the communication landscape. And how do you see that role moving forward in, in one minute? <laughs> Thanks, Laurie. It was <laughs> the last person always has the, the rush. Um, so first of all, I really, um, you know, this is a really interesting discussion and we should continue it. I think for, for me, it's about being aware of the impact of information, disinformation, the risks. Um, how, how do we help manage that? What are the things like neutrality? Really, really important. So there's a kind of huge implication to some of the stuff we've been talking about. And I think the, day, the risk is we get lost in old conversations around I don't know, dare I say it, colonialism or localization, when actually there's some really critical issues here. So I, first of all, I think there's, you know, what what are the big issues in this space? And I think CDAC has a role in, in, in identifying those, along with other the other the other panelists. I think we do need to look for new ways to empower lo local voices uh, in humanitarian decision making and broader. But given that local actors are so such a, hu a huge number, it's how, how do we really um, ensure that, that there is empowerment and there is ownership of that in, into the system. I think we need to recognise the role that new tech will play and that's going to evolve and, you know, people do want internet access and mobile phone chargers and all, of, all the rest of it now. So how do we harness that? But how do we make it in a way which is not top down? So I think I think there's an important stuff there and we need to learn lessons more effectively. So we've talked quite a lot around kind of lessons from different crises, but I've not really seen a good synthesis that pulls together some of these really critical lessons and then suggests a way forward. Um, so I think there's a kind of a few a few thoughts that I'm left with, but I think you know certainly political analysis is really critical as well here. So this is not just about operational lens. This is about using a political lens to understand really how 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 the kind of information landscape empowers or constrains people. 
Absolutely. Well, I don't really have any time to wrap up, but I think all of our panelists have wrapped up for me. Maybe just a final reflection from my side. I, I mentioned that I started in this work 21 years ago and um, at the Yugoslav, uh, during the Yugoslav wars. And at that time, we were really pushing the humanitarian community to understand information as a right, as a need um, in humanitarian context. And what struck me by today's conversation is how much this has, the, the thinking has evolved. It's not simply about provision of information so that people fleeing a war zone will know where to gain assistance. It's really about their right to be heard and um, the need to ensure that communities that are affected by crises really are given a voice and given a voice in how the, the, the humanitarian assistance is uh, deployed, but also in their overall futures. And so it remains, I think, even more important today than 20 years ago, because we're not only trying to ensure accurate information, we also have to combat that disinformation, that misinformation. So it really is my hope that this area of endeavor gains more prominence in the humanitarian sector and that we understand, as you said, Dylan, it's not just the operational you know, dimensions, it's very much the policy, the political dimensions that are at stake, I think, um, for the future of humanitarian action. So um, I would like to thank CDAC uh, very much. It, we covered a lot of ground. I, at one point, I thought we were covering maybe just about every different dimension of information and communication from warmongering to humanitarian assistance. But it's a vast, it's a vast subject, and I, I really want to congratulate CDAC for continuing to raise attention to this issue. And thank you also to all the panelists who joined us today and shared your thoughts and wishing you a very good continuation of Humanitarian Partnership Week. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.